going live. Going live. And we're live. That is exciting. A few minutes out from the beginning of our service. Give everybody opportunity to come and join us. Yeah. Good morning, Mike. Good to have you on board. Glad you came. Pastor Dan. No, oh, he's accepted the invite. Thought maybe he had joined us. He will shortly, I'm sure. So how is life at the Miller House? There's Don. Good to have you back on board, Don. And we will be praying for Connecticut. Glenn Corsi, welcome from Kansas City. Good to have you with us this morning. How are things in KC? Things here are looking good. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. I think we are uh, beginning to move into the uh, non-rainy season, whatever they call it here. It's going to be summer. Rainy season. Oh, rainy season in the summer. Good morning, the Stokies. Hello, Mike. Hello, Eden. Hello, Sophie. Hello, Alvin. So we're uh, four minutes out. Well, I'm glad that you're all good. Gail was asking the other day if Nate's still doing music stuff. I told her I think so, but I'm not sure. Eleven of us are tuned in. If you're tuning in, say hello. We'd like to know who is watching so that we can greet you and have an idea of what's going on and where it's going on from. We've had people tuning in from all over the country. Uh, people from Naples, that's not surprising. People from Ohio, and that's not surprising. People from Connecticut, and that's not surprising either, but people from Texas. Hello, people from Texas and people from Nevada, people from Tennessee, people from the Philippines, Arizona. people from Arizona. Arabia. Had someone tune in from Saudi Arabia, had a couple of people tune in from India, which is kind of wild. Good morning, Linda. Good to have you with us from Phoenix, talking about those Arizona people. Doug, welcome Team Shear from Connecticut. Hello, Bonnie from Connecticut. Good to have you on board. Pastor Diane, good to have you and Sandy with us all the way from the Naples Estates. Stephanie, welcome Stephanie. Good to see you from Fairfield. Is Linda saying good morning? I didn't see Rad. You got Rad? Rad joined us all the way from uh, a quarter mile away from us. Oh, good. More people are coming on. If you're just coming on, say hello. We'd like to know where you're from. Like to know who is watching out there. Got Don Tina. 
Good morning, Tina. You watching by yourself, Tina, or are there other people in the house with you? Trenton, Ohio. Yeah, Tina. Other people, as you join us, let us know that you're out there and that you're tuning in. Like to know where you're from. 1043 on my computer clock, two minutes until we get officially rolling. It's good to greet all of you. One of the things I miss about actually being live and in person is being actually able to see you and greet you and to shake hands and to see your smiling faces. So as you let me know that your smiling faces are uh, online with us, that helps me. Yeah. Anybody else coming on? Would you like to say hello? We are at 1044. We got uh, a minute or so until we get rolling. Sharon, welcome. And uh, all your family. Quentin, Quentin's with us. Welcome, Quentin. And how do I get rid of that? Roselle's with us. Oh, Bonnie wants to see Gail's face. Oh, Jose, we got a moment here before we start. Well, we'll have Gail come around and say hello when uh, when we're uh, on the back side of this at the end. Sidera, welcome. Good to have you with us. Yeah. Lisa Kleinus, hello, Lisa, all the way from Akron, Ohio. Great to see you. Is Bob with you this morning? I uh, hope so. Gail tells me that uh, Diana has come on. Diana from Nevada. Welcome, Diana. I see Rizal's here all the way from the Philippines. Good morning. I guess it's good evening where you are. That is great. All right. There is Diana. I want to see Gail. All right. We're going to see Gail after we're done. So that's in Central stay on and that will give Gail time to uh, make herself know if she is presentable. All right, officially, good morning and welcome to Paradise Coast Church. Jesus tells us that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And so here he is among us this morning. God is in the house or in the computer, or in the internet, or however it is he does it, he's with us. So uh, let's have a quick prayer to uh, welcome him into our service. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together through this technology, and we thank you for the ways that you are with us. We are amazed that you're able to be with us in each house and in each place, and we ask that you would be at work throughout the service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you're coming on board, say hello. We'd like to know that you're there and uh, who's there. It helps us uh, know what's going on and who we're reaching. So uh, very good. We're going to be uh, praying in a moment. And if you could send in prayer requests and praise reports, prayer requests and praise reports. We will do our best to include those in our prayer here in the service. So prayer requests, things that you'd like to see God do, praise reports, things that God has done in the past week or so, ways that God has answered your prayer and our prayers. I wanna start us off with uh, Psalm 27. This is a Psalm of David. <clears throat> And I want to give you the context in which David wrote it. As I do, I think you'll see that it is a uh, psalm that is 
uh, very apropos for our day. So David, if you remember the story of David's life, David anointed king at a very young age. The only problem with that is there's another king in the land whose name is Saul. It's not long before Saul hears about David. It's not much longer after that that Saul becomes jealous of David. Saul begins chasing David all over the Israelite countryside, trying to kill him. After 20 years of chase, David is tired of the chase. He leaves Israel, goes to live in the land of the Philistines. As time goes by, the Israelites and the Philistines go to war with each other. David and his men leave the village of Ziglag where they live for the Philistine kings to offer their services in the upcoming battles. The Philistine kings say to David, thank you, but no, we don't trust you to fight with us against your own countrymen. Go home. So David and his men go home. And as they top the crest of the hill to look down on the village of Ziglag, they can't see it. All they can see is smoke. And they hurry down the hill and underneath the smoke, what they find is ashes and smoldering rubble. While they had been gone, raiders had come, raided their village, carried off all the flocks and the herds and all the women and children. There is nobody left. David and his men fall down into the dust and the ashes and weep till they could weep no more. Then one of David's men said, this is all David's fault. He led us away from our family so that we couldn't protect them. Let's stone David. And there in the dust and the ashes, with no friends, no family, no home, not even a battle to fight, David writes these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I become one thing. One thing have I asked of the Lord. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in a day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling place. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head shall be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn from your servant in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. O oh God, my Savior, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will never desert me. Do your ways, O oh Lord, lead me in a straight path the oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes. For as false witness Isaac up against me, breathing out violence. I am confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take courage. Wait for the Lord. Okay, prayer requests are coming in. Dottie asked that we pray for Elsie. Don asks that we pray for Connecticut and for people to come to Christ and for the healing of this country. We want to pray for Roger Vasek, who is battling cancer. Okay, Roger's got some buyers that he's working with, uh, wants a deal to go through. Uh, Stephanie asked prayer for her Nic sister, Nicole. Uh, starting radiation for breast cancer. I'm going to pray for Lisa Kleinis' knee. She broke it. Two screws. She's got back pain. Okay, Lisa. We will pray for you. We want to pray for uh, Stephen. 
who's got lung issues and some personal uh, struggles that he's dealing with. We want to pray for the Philippines. Uh, Brian asked that we pray for his dad. Uh, he's in memory care, uh, not doing so well. Uh, his, Brian's mom can't visit him. All the social distancing stuff. Did you have another one, Gail? Okay. All right. Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning thankful that you are our refuge, our strength, and an ever-present help in times of trouble. We rejoice with the words of David that you are our light and our salvation, that because of you we need not fear. We rejoice with the words of David that said, even though our mother and father forsake us, you will never forsake us. You never forget us. You never turn your back on us. You never walk away from us. It doesn't we do. Doesn't matter what kind of trouble we get into. Doesn't matter how low we sink or how high we rise. You still claim us. You're still with us. Isaiah the prophet tells us, or rather you told Isaiah, that you have written our names, carved our names in the palm of your hands, so that you would never forget us, so that you would never desert us, so that you would never forsake us. And Father, in the midst of the troubles that we face, it is a comfort and a help to know that you never desert us and you never turn away from us. Father, we lift our eyes to our country as a whole. Uh, we thank you that President Trump and his advisors are working on ways to open our country back up. We thank you for the phases that they have put in place and for uh, turning those things over to governors to make decisions as to what's going on in their states. We thank you that uh, one of the hot spots, uh, New York, New York and New Jersey, uh, that the curve uh, has turned downward and that the cases and the hospitalizations and the deaths are uh, far less than what they were, showing that the virus is passing out of that area. Father, we pray for other hot spots, uh, Detroit, Chicago, Los or, uh, New Orleans. We pray, Father, that you would uh, reverse the curve in those places. We pray that you would send a healing to those cities that you would eradicate the coronavirus there. Father, we pray for the rest of the country. Uh, we're not in as bad a shape as those places are that we just prayed for, but we have corona cases here in uh, Naples. The uh, number of cases continues to increase day by day by day. There's only 400 and some cases right now, but uh, the number keeps going up, and we want to see that number turn around. And there are other places in the country, uh, California, Arizona, uh, Nevada, uh, Ohio, where we want to see Connecticut, where we want to see the number of cases begin to drop. We ask, Father, that you would lift uh, the coronavirus from our land. And we pray, Father, not only for our land, but for all of the countries of the world that are struggling with this, when we look at a map to see where it is, we see that it is indeed a worldwide problem. In John 16, we're told that you love the world, the whole world and everybody in it. And we ask that you would reach out your hands and touch the whole world and bring healing to all the nations of the earth. We pray for those who are on the front lines of this, doctors and nurses and paramedics. Please help them. Please keep them safe. Please keep them strong. Please guide their hands. Please give them wisdom. We thank you, Father, for the medicines that are 
are being effective. And we ask that you would continue to work through the medicines and continue to work through our prayers to bring healing to those who have this. Father, we pray for those who are in intensive care units and we ask that you would reverse the course of the virus in them and that you would send them out of the intensive care units with healing and that you would send them back. Father, we pray for families who have lost a lot of this. Please comfort. Father, we pray for those who have lost jobs, who are facing financial uncertainty. Please bring them peace. Please bring them prayer. Father, we pray for Lisa, who broke her knee. We ask that you would bring healing to her knee. We ask, Father, that you would bring her recovery from that surgery. We ask the screws that have been inserted would do her job, and that as the recovery happens and as she works to rehab, she would have a full and free use of that knee again. Please uh, bring healing to her back. We pray for Stephanie's sister, Nicole, and we ask that you would bring healing of the breast cancer. Please give her and her family peace and a sense of expectation of your work here. We pray for Brian's dad, who's uh, in memory care and doesn't seem to be doing well. We pray for family who wants to get in to see him but can't. Please be at work in that whole situation. We pray for Lynn and her mom, a uh, similar situation there with nursing home and wanting to see her and wanting to ask that you would be at work in that situation. We pray for uh, Roger, a real estate deal that he's got working. We ask that uh, good terms can be arrived at there and that everyone can be happy with the coming deal. We pray for Connecticut. We ask that you would bring healing throughout Connecticut. We pray, Father, for Connecticut. We pray for Naples. We pray for uh, the whole country, that during the midst of this distress and struggle, trouble, that people would turn to you, that people would call out to you for help. We pray for the Philippines and ask that you would be at work in the Philippines and ask that you would cause people in the Philippines to cry out to you for help. Father, we ask that your spirit would sweep across the world and that there would be an awakening and a revival like has never been seen before and that there would be millions upon tens of millions of people worldwide turning to you. And we certainly ask that that would happen in America. And we ask that you would cause that to happen uh, through our prayers and that you would use us in our efforts along with the efforts and the prayers of lots of other people around the country who are praying. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you. And in these moments of silence, uh, we lift up the other thing on our hearts. Please talk to God about what's going on in your life. Thank you, Father, for the work that you're doing. We pray for Stephen. We ask that you would bring healing to his lungs. And we ask that you would give him victory over the struggles that he's having uh, within the rest of his life. Father, we ask that as our service continues, that you would open our ears that we might hear, that you would open our minds that we might understand. We ask to open our hearts that we might read all that you have for us this day. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I am so glad that God always and everywhere hears our prayers. I can catch up on my slides here. Oh, there we are. Has anyone noticed that things seem to be far different than they were at the beginning of March? At the beginning of March, we were holding worship in a theater and many of you were in other churches or unable to be with us. But since March, we have been dealing with pandemics. Yes, 
two pandemics. The first pandemic is the coronavirus, but the coronavirus is the smaller of the two pandemics we're dealing with. The larger of the two pandemics is fear. With the coronavirus, we were attacked by a fear pandemic and the fear pandemic has rolled over us with four waves. The first wave of the fear pandemic was we're all going to die. The second wave of the fear pandemic is that with social distancing and the shutdown of the economy, the economy is never going to open. And even if it does, we'll never work again. And again, we're going to be poor and destitute all of our lives. The third wave of the fear pandemic is that if the country is turn to work, the coronavirus is going to come back in a huge rebound and it's going to be worse than it was before. And the fourth wave of the fear pandemic is whatever the new normal looks like, it's going to be government overreach, government regulations and government intrusion into every part of our lives just to keep us safe. Whew. Fear. And then you add that fear to the fear that's already in our lives, uh, fears that we have over health situations, over financial situations, over relational situations, over family situations, and we are just flooded with fear. In the midst of these two pandemics, I have good news. Jesus has a message for us. The message for Jesus in the midst of these two pandemics, the coronavirus and fear, is found in John's Gospel. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. With all the virus and all the fear all around us, untroubled hearts. And I'm going to spend the next four weeks talking about how we can have untroubled hearts. And if we're going to have untroubled hearts in the midst of the pandemic, the first thing that we need to do is to address fear. So that's where I'm going this morning. They're having some audio, and what does the audio difficulty look like? See, the audio is going in and out. Okay, I don't know what to do about that. My limited technical experiences, I can turn this thing off and I can turn this thing off. So uh, let's pray that the audio stuff clears up so that we can deal with fear. Father, I ask that you would clear up the uh, audio issue that's going on. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's causing it, but you do. I ask that uh, you would send an angel to come and play uh, IT force and to resolve the so that we can hear. I ask that you would uh, secure the live stream and the feed so that it gets securely to everybody's house and into everybody's computer. In the name of God, amen. Okay, so uh, here we go. Fear. And we begin looking at fear in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Jesus and his disciples uh, get into the boat. Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Let me tell you about the storm. Furious storm. The Greek word for storm here is seismos, which indicates that the storm was not just a storm in the air, but it was also a storm uh, from beneath the lake as there was an earthquake or something. Set up from and from above. 
lots and lots of storm in the lake, furious storm, super storm kind of thing. Uh, and the waves are sweeping over the boat. The picture that the Greek words give is that the boat is hidden in the waves. So what this looks like if you're sitting in the boat is you're sitting in the boat and the waves are four, five, 10, 12 feet above the boat. And it's wave after wave and those huge waves on each side of the boat and they crash around the boat. Some of them crash against the boat. Some of them crash into the boat. The boat is taking on water. The boat is not going to survive. Now that's what's happening around the boat. I want to take us inside the boat. There are two things to see inside, to see inside the boat is the disciples. So, uh, make their living on the Sea of Galilee. They know when a fishing boat is in trouble. This fishing boat is way past trouble. They are frantically doing everything that they can to keep the boat afloat, but they know that they're in the midst of a losing battle. The second thing to see in the boat is Jesus. And what's Jesus doing? Jesus, according to the text, is sleeping. How in the world can Jesus sleep in the midst of the storm. So I guess this is an important message because we've not crashed before. So here we go with the rest of it. So as you remember, the disciples, uh, Jesus in the boat, a huge storm. The disciples are doing everything they can to keep the boat from going under because the storm is so big. And we come to see uh, what Jesus is doing in the boat while they're all trying to keep the boat afloat. Jesus is sleeping. How in the world do you sleep in the midst of a superstorm? How in the world do you sleep with waves crashing against the boat? How is Jesus sleeping? Is he a heavy sleeper? Is he really tired? Or is it because he's Jesus? Well, maybe, but I think there's something else going on here. But we'll come back to it. Hang on to why is Jesus able to sleep in the midst of the storm? The disciples are fighting this losing battle against the wind and the waves. Their ship is going to go under at any moment. They're all going to drown. There's only one thing left to do. They do it. They wake Jesus. It says right there, the disciples went and woke Jesus saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus wakes up, looks around, but before he gets up, before he does anything else, he asks the disciples a question. He asked the disciples a question. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? I picture Andrew holding on to the side of the boat for dear life, saying to Jesus, more likely yelling to Jesus through the storm, why are we afraid? Jesus, we're in the middle of a storm. Don't you see the waves? Don't you feel the rain in your face? Don't you feel the wind blowing? How can you say, why are you afraid? And at that moment, a 10 foot wave collapses on top of Andrew and nearly washes Andrew and two other disciples out of the boat. When Andrew recovers, he says, what kind of question was that anyway? How can we, how can you ask, why are you so afraid? And as Andrew finishes, a 15-foot wave rises up. It's going to smash the boat to smithereens. But before we get there, let's talk about fear for a moment. Why are we so afraid? Why does fear eat our lunch every single time? We get afraid when we lose control. We get afraid when there is a situation 
and we can't control it. We get afraid when we can't make things happen that we want to have happen. We get afraid when we can't stop things from happening that are happening. And the more important it is to us that those things happen or those things don't happen, the more afraid we get, and that being afraid builds fear within us. We lose power, we lose control, we become overcome with fear, we get afraid. This year, 60,000 or so people will die from the flu. But are we afraid of the flu? No. Why aren't we afraid of the flu? Well, we feel like we've got control of the flu. Been there, done that. I get the flu, what am I going to do? I'm going to take it easy for a couple of days and the flu will start to go away. If that doesn't work, I'll go down to the local drugstore and I'll load myself up with over-the-counter flu medications and they'll work. Or maybe I'll get grandma to make me a nice big crock of hot steaming chicken noodle soup or I'll take some other natural family recipe. If those don't work, I'll go to the doctor. He's got all kinds of medicines. That'll take care of it. And if what the doctor gives me doesn't work, I'll wind up in the hospital and they'll pump me full of IVs and all kinds of stuff. I'll be happy and soon I'll be well. Yeah, 60,000 people a year die of flu, but it's not going to happen to me. I got this. We got this. Nothing to be afraid of. It's only the flu. The coronavirus comes and we are told this is brand new. We've never seen it before. There is no cure for it. We don't know how to treat it. We don't know how to cure it. We don't know what it's going to do. We don't know how it acts. The coronavirus is 10 times more contagious than the flu, they tell us. We can't stop it from spreading. Control is taken away. We have no control over corona. We have no history with it. We're told that nothing we can do will cure it. Grandma's chicken noodle soup doesn't even make a dent in it. We're told that everyone's going to get it, that we can't prevent getting it. There is no control at all. Suddenly, we're afraid. And one fear leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. We humans are control freaks. You take control away from us, and we freak! That's who we are. That's what we do. But Jesus tells us it's possible to have an untroubled heart. And Jesus himself is sleeping during the storm. <laughs> Back with the boat, Jesus' question still stands, even though Andrew is soaked from a fresh wave and there's a huge wave that's about to hit them. His question still stands. Why are you so afraid? And Andrew would say, the storm. And we would say the coronavirus and the social distancing and the economy and all the rest. But Jesus would say, no, I didn't ask what were you afraid of. I asked why. And Andrew would say, I don't care about the answer to that, just take away the storm. And we would say, I don't care about the answer to that, just take away the virus and make life the way it was before. But Jesus' question stands, why are we so afraid? And the answer to the question is found in the very first part of it. Oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? It's found in the first part, the answer. Oh, you little faith. Faith, faith, faith means trust. Faith means belief. Faith, trust, believe. Faith is about who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do we collectively turn to in the midst of the storm? Most of us, when a storm comes, we turn to ourselves. We trust ourselves. We believe in ourselves. We got this. We can handle this. We know what to do. We take initiative. Uh, we're Americans and all the rest of that stuff. And if we can't solve the health storm on our own, or if we can't solve the economic storm on our own, we go to the doctor. We go to the hospital. We take medicines. That's where we turn. That's who we trust. 
in the economic storm. We, we turn to our boss. We turn to our small business. We turn to our corporation. We ask for a raise. We ask for help. We turn to financial experts. We turn to the stock market. That's who we turn. That's who we trust. The problem is where we turn and who we trust isn't able to handle the storms that come our way. Oh, we say, I got this. Or we say collectively, we got this. We got this. My doctor's got this. My financial advisor's got this. My company's got this. My team of experts have this. And in dire situations, we might even say the government's got this. But the truth is, we don't have it. Well, we got about this much of it, but we need to have this much more. Who do you turn to in the midst of the storm? I remember the storm. I was maybe four years old. The storm was in the middle of the night. It was a loud storm. The thunder rattled the windows in the bedroom, in the bedroom where I was sleeping. The thunder rattled my little rib cage. The rain, you could hear it on the roof. It pounded against the windows. It was a bright storm. The sky kept lighting up every couple of minutes and it lit up so brightly. It lit right through my curtains and lit up my dark room. It was bright, then it was dark, then it was bright, then it was dark, and it was noisy, then it was quiet, then it was noisy, and you could hear the rain. And there was this bolt of lightning that happened with a crack and an explosion of thunder all at the same time that jolted me out of bed. And who did I run to in the midst of the storm? I ran right into my parents' bedroom and up into the bed. If I could just get near dad if I could just be with my dad it would be okay and I got next to my dad with my dad and the storm is still raging but I was okay I was with my dad the whole house could have blown away but I was with my dad and it was okay who do we turn to in the midst of the storm Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he's not in a storm. He's in his father's arms. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, has got this. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, loves him. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, in heaven has his best interest at heart. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, is able to take anything that happens and make good come out of it. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father, in heaven is right there with him. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows he's not alone. Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm because he knows that his father, our father in heaven, has got him, has got his life, and it's going to be okay. He may not know how it's going to be okay, but he knows it's going to be okay because his father, our father in heaven, has this. And his father, our father in heaven, is far bigger, far more powerful than the storm. The disciples are freaked in the midst of the storm because they don't know. They don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven has this storm. They don't know, they don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven loves them. They don't know, they don't believe, they don't trust that our Father in heaven has their best interest at heart. They don't know, they don't believe that our Father in heaven is going to take care of them. They don't know, they don't believe that our Father in heaven is right there with them in the midst of the boat. They believe that they're alone and that God is nowhere to be seen and can't be turned to and can't be trusted, and so they are afraid. Who do we turn to in the midst of the storm? Who do we trust? Jesus says it's possible 
for us to have such trust in God that in the midst of the storm, we can sleep alongside with him, knowing that our Father God has us and has the storm. So let me ask a question. How? How did Jesus know this about God? Well, Jesus knew this about God because he spent time with God. Well, not a little bit here, not five minutes there, not running the car here, not 911 prayers, but time with God. Jesus spent extended amounts of time with God. We're always reading about Jesus leaving the crowds. He's leaving the crowds to go up into the hills to pray. He's sending away the crowd to go up to the mountain to pray. He's sending away the disciples so they can go pray. He sends the disciples the other side of the lake so they can go pray. He leaves the miracles so they can go pray. He spends extended periods of time with God in prayer. And part of what he's doing in those extended periods of time is not only talking with God about what's going on, but being still before God, listening to God, letting God love him, letting God imprint God's nature and character in his life so that Jesus knows here in his heart and here in his head that his Father in heaven is with him, loves him, and has got whatever it is that life brings his direction. Catch up to my slides. So if Jesus needs to spend time with God in order to be calm in the midst of the storm, what about you and me? I mean, if Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God has to spend time with God in order to be calm, how much more so do we need to spend time with God in order to be calm in the midst of the storm? Now, if I were to spend time with God, if I were to spend extended periods of time with God, what would I do? Well, what are the things that cause you to feel loved by God that cause you to feel close to God? Some people feel God's love and God's presence when they go walk in the woods. If you feel God's love and God's presence when you walk in the woods, go walk in the woods. Walk in the woods a lot. If you feel God's presence and God's love uh, when you play uh, praise and worship music and you sing along, then play the music and sing along a lot. If you feel God's presence as a result of sitting in a room all by yourself where there's nobody else around and nothing to disturb you, where you can focus on God, then go sit in the room and be alone with God. Do it a lot. If you feel God's presence in your love and your life as a result of helping someone, then go help a bunch of people. I know that we're socially distanced, but you can still find ways to help people. If you feel God's presence and God's love as a result of reading the Bible or reading other Christian authors, then read. Read a lot. Do those things that put us in God's presence and cause us to feel loved by God. Someone mentioned to me, you know, with social distancing and I'm working less hours or I'm not working at all, I got time on my hands and I'm not quite sure what to do. Well, spend some of it with God. And as we're spending time with God, I want to share with you four faith-building passages of Scripture for us to hone in on and to read and work through every day. Here they are. The first one is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I want. Read that and don't just read it. Read it slowly and don't just read it. Pray it. Jesus, be my shepherd. Jesus, please supply my needs, my wants. Jesus, please make me lay down in green pastures. Jesus, please lead me beside still waters. Jesus, please lead me in paths of righteousness. Or say thank you with the prayer. Jesus, thank you for being my shepherd. Jesus, thank you for supplying my wants and my needs. And Make a list. Thank you that I've got groceries. Thank you that I've got toilet paper in the house. Thank you that I've got money to pay the bills. Thank you that I've got a roof over my head. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supplying. Thank you for leading me beside still waters. Thank you for restoring my soul. 
It's the 23rd Psalm. Get into it. Read it. Pray it. Second passage to get into and to have it get into our heads, into our hearts, are the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This is the passage where Jesus says, why are you worried about what you eat, about what you drink, about what you will wear, about what you will live? Isn't life more important than that? And Jesus continues on and closes that passage saying, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Which is to say, he's going to take care of that. He's going to provide for that. We don't have to worry about those things. What Jesus wants us to do instead is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And as we do that, as we seek God's face, as we seek God's kingdom, as we seek God's righteousness, God is going to give us all the stuff that we need. He'll make sure there's a roof over our heads. He'll make sure the bills are paid. He'll make sure there's uh, groceries on the table, toilet paper, uh, in the bathroom, he'll take care of all that. And our job is to seek first the kingdom, to seek first God. So read the passage, read it slowly, pray the passage. God, I'm worried about what I'm gonna eat. Please take care of what I'm gonna eat. I'm worried about how I'm gonna pay the rent. Please take care of how I'm gonna pay the rent. God, please help me to seek your face. Please help me to seek your face. Please help me to focus. Every day, get into that passage. Third passage is from Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning with verse 28, going to verse uh, 39. This passage begins with, In all things, God works together for good for those who love him. In all things, God works God works everything for good for those who love him. God works everything for good for those who love him. God works everything for good for those who love him. God works the coronavirus for good for those who love him. God works social distancing for good for those who love him. God works economic shortfalls for good for those who love him. God works uh, financial hardships for good for those who love him. God works uh, disease and illness and sickness for good for those who love him. God works uh, relational difficulties, marriage problems, family issues for good for those who love him. God works all things for good for those who love him. And get into that verse, read it and pray it out. All the things that you're worried about, all the things that you're concerned about, all the bad stuff that's going on. List it. God works that item and that item and that item and that item for good in your life. Can you see what the good is right now? Maybe not, but God is working it for good. And the passage ends with, and there is nothing in all creation that is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The coronavirus can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Social distancing can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Economic difficulty can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, health difficulties can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Relational difficulties can't separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And read the passage. Pray the passage. Dig into the passage and put your situation into the passage. Just do that daily. The last passage is uh, 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And there John writes, Dear children, you have overcome the spirits of the world. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. What are the spirits of the world that we have overcome? Well, right now it sounds like this. The sky is falling, we're all gonna die. We have overcome that because greater is he who is in us than the fear that is in the world. Who is the he that is in us? God the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth has made his dwelling place in our hearts. Jesus Christ 
the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one who died on the cross to bring us forgiveness and to bring his Holy Spirit and to make us into the dwelling place of God has come to dwell in our hearts. The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, the very power of God in our lives to change our hearts and to make a difference in the world around us and to use us to make that difference dwells in our hearts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is stronger than anything or anyone or any spirit that is in the world out there. The one who is in us is stronger than the one who is in us is stronger than social distancing. The one who is in us is stronger than economic hardship. The one who is in us is stronger than and you fill in the blank. Now, it's impossible to read those passages and work through them the way that I've just worked through them and still be afraid. As we work through those passages, we discover that God is with us, that God loves us, that God cares about us, that God can be counted upon, that God can be trusted. Oh, even though everyone's still afraid, and even though the virus is still out there, and even though the economy hasn't been opened back up yet, God's got us. And as long as we're with him, we'll be all right. We're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. We're going to be all right. We might even grow. And the reason I know this is the one who lives within me is greater than the one who is causing all the trouble out there. What I want you to be able to do is to crawl up into God's arms like a two or a three or a four year old will crawl up into their father's arms and be safe and be comforted and be at peace. Because when we get at peace in here, we can deal with all the stuff that's out there. We're gonna pray in a minute, but I want you to know that next week, we're gonna talk about our thoughts and our self-talk and how they get us off track and how we can get back on track with our thoughts and our self-talk so that we can have untroubled hearts through this storm. God is with us. He knows you. He loves you. He's got you. It's going to be okay. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have us and that you've got this. In these moments of silence, I ask that your peace and your presence would wash over all of us who are gathered here today. And Father, if there is someone here who uh, doesn't have you on the inside, that never invited Jesus to come in, uh, I invite them to pray along with me this little prayer. Jesus, Please come into my heart. Please forgive me all the stuff that I've messed up. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me live different. And as you pray that prayer, there is forgiveness. <clears throat> your stuff is paid for. You're set free from it. And the love and the grace and the peace and the mercy and the favor and the presence of God moves into your heart. And you can be at peace. Thank you, Father, for your peace and for helping us to turn to you in the midst of the storm. Thank you for our untroubled hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, take a breath. We prayed. Jose is going to pass the offering baskets. Uh, you still out there, Jose? Uh, so Jose's passing the offering baskets. And if you don't see Jose come by you with an offering basket, uh, you can give online.
Go to paradisecoastchurch.org, look for the giving tab, and you'll find directions there. Thank you for those of you who have been giving that way. Uh, we've been receiving your gifts. That function works. And if you're not comfortable giving electronically, you can send an offering to us in the mail. Uh, mail your check or whatever to 981 Hampton Circle, Naples, Florida, 34105. If you're in Canada or the Philippines, you can mail it to 981 Hampton Circle, Naples, Florida, 3105. Uh, my email address is there. So you got all that information. A couple of announcements for us on Wednesday. Wednesday at 7 p.m., I will be on Zoom. I have posted a Zoom link on Facebook. I have sent a Zoom invitation to a couple of you that I know. We're going to have a Zoom group, and our Zoom group is Untroubled Hearts. What we're going to do at our Zoom group from 7 to uh, 8.15, 8.30, is we're going to take a look at uh, some of the things that I talked about this morning. We're going to take a look at how are you dealing with the fear? What passages of Scripture do you use? How do these passages of Scripture help you? What insights do you have? How can we help each other deal with the fear? And we're going to pray for each other. So Zoom meeting, Untroubled Hearts, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. We'll do this for the next four weeks as we work through the Untroubled Hearts series. Hope to see you there. If you want personal invite to it and the link and all of that, uh, message me, uh, send me an email, and I'll get it out to you. Like I say, it's on the uh, Paradise Coast Church Facebook page. Uh, other announcement, I got a study going Wednesday morning in the book of Acts. We're in uh, Acts chapter 9. Uh, there's a Zoom link on the Facebook page for that. That's 7 a.m. Einstein, I'm sorry, 8 a.m. Einstein Bagel Study is what that one's called. I will be investigating uh, why we crashed in the middle of the service week this week, and hopefully we can uh, take whatever remedy is needed. Uh, also, uh, next week we'll have a different look. I've gotten some new software. I've got it about halfway learned week I'll learn the other half of it uh, I think we'll be able to have some music and do some other stuff so that's coming benediction oh but before the benediction I have a question was God in the house if God was in the house give me a like uh, send me a, a comment saying that God was in the house and if God was in the house if God was in your house speaking to you through this message. I uh, invite someone to tune in with you next week. Maybe invite them to your place, have them sit six feet away from you, or tell them how they can connect up with this on their very own uh, phone or laptop or tablet or other mobile device. Benediction. May the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for tuning in. I told you that we would have Gail make an appearance at the end of the service. So, Gail, come on around here and say hello to all of those of you who wanted to see Gail. Here she comes. Three, two, one. There she is. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Best I can tell, there are between somewhere 45 to 50 of you today. Cool. Um, I'm not sure how many made it back exactly. Um, but thank you all for coming. All right. You can go back where you were and help me uh, scroll through the comments. Uh, okay. Got Mike back. Don's back. Tara. Pastor Dan's back. Bruce back. Patty's back. We don't give up easy. Good. Yeah, this will be posted on, uh, on YouTube later. 
Amen, Bonnie. God, having faith. God, amen from the Philippines. Amen from Tara. Amen from Bonnie. Lots of hope. Kit, God was in the house. All right. Oh, Michael says, hi, Gail. Bonnie says, hi. Kit says, hi. Sharon, it's good to have you with us. He was in the house. All right. Okay, well, I am going to sign off. Look forward to being with you next week. Uh, connect with you on Wednesday. And God bless you and have untroubled hearts.